In episode three of this series on drawing tablet pressure, we explore pressure curves. To do this correctly, we have to keep a clear distinction between a pressure curve and a pressure response. I began talking about pressure response in episode two, but we're going to go deeper. So I will quickly summarize and then we can start getting into the details. If you take a digital scale that measures physical pressure, and then an application like Krita that shows you logical pressure, you can collect a set of data points. Those data points will relate physical and logical pressure for a specific pen. If you plot those data points out on a chart with the physical pressure on the x-axis and the logical pressure on the y-axis, you get this chart. This is the pressure response for a specific pen. This defines the pressure behavior of the pen. Keep in mind, drivers and pen-aware applications don't know anything about physical pressure. They only know about logical pressure. They have no idea how hard you're pressing down, whether it's 1 gram force or 50 gram force, etc. They have no clue. They just get this abstract, unitless number between 0 and 1, which is the logical pressure. Digital art applications like Krita or Clip Studio Paint they take logical pressure and compute things about your brush strokes, like width or opacity or color. In this video, I will only show you how these kinds of applications take the pressure and then apply it to the width of the stroke. But everything I'm saying fundamentally applies to opacity or color, etc. The only reason I'm talking about the width of the stroke is because it is much easier to show you and to talk about what the effect is on the stroke. The pressure response represents the behavior of a pen with respect to pressure. If you want a different behavior, that's when you use a pressure curve. In this example, the original pressure response is the purple line. We apply a pressure curve to it, and then we get a new pressure response, that's the line in orange. This new pressure response has a very different shape. It's much more linear. Whatever shape a pressure response has, we need to develop some way to reason about it. We need to understand what we want out of a pressure response and how we use pressure curves to get us there. I like to think about this as a game of resource allocation. We have a finite resource and we are trying to spend it wisely. The finite resource in this case is the physical pressure range of the pen. The difference between the maximum physical pressure and the initial activation force for a specific pen. Our job in this game is to allocate segments of this physical pressure range to help us draw or help us solve problems that we're having while we're drawing, or maybe even achieve certain effects with our brush strokes. The pressure response shape that I started with bends up quite a bit. This is extremely common for EMR pens. In fact, every Wacom pen I've ever measured bends up in this way. And it's not limited to Wacom. This also seems to be the case with Huion and XP pen and other brands. At the lower left of the pressure response is a steep slope. About 10% of the physical pressure range is allocated to about 50% of the logical pressure range. So we are under allocating physical pressure range in this section. This means that small changes in physical pressure produce big changes in logical pressure, which produce big changes in the width of the stroke. This can make it feel like you don't have control over your stroke. It may feel like the pen is too sensitive. You might find that you are not able to maintain a consistent width as you draw. Sensitivity in this lower range is often described by the phrase softness because it does not take much effort to make those big changes with the brush stroke. And tablets tend to lean toward a softer pressure response, which is why we often have to consider using pressure curves to adjust them. At the other end of the pressure response, we see a different kind of problem. Here, 50% of the physical pressure range is allocated to only about 20% of the logical pressure range. So we are over allocating physical pressure range in this section. This means big changes in physical pressure produce small changes in logical pressure, which produces small changes in the width of the stroke. It can feel like you're pressing very hard, but you are just barely changing the width of the stroke. As a starting point, maybe it would be better if we try to allocate physical pressure range more evenly across the logical pressure range. 
this would result in a pressure response that looks more like a straight line. And this should give us a more consistent pressure behavior for the pen. The size of the brush stroke will grow or shrink in ways that closely match the amount of physical pressure that we apply. Okay, so we need a new pressure response. And the way we do that is we use a pressure curve. In effect, a pressure curve takes one pressure response and creates a new pressure response. Conceptually, a pressure curve is a simple mathematical function. It takes a logical input pressure P and gives out a logical output pressure P prime. So it's just a function that uses some math to transform numbers and we can make it do anything we want. We could use different pressure functions to create different pressure curves to address all sorts of problems. But rather than having many different functions, a more typical approach is to define a single pressure curve function and have that function be parameterized so that we can tweak the parameters of the function and get a wide variety of pressure curves. You'll see an example of a parameterized pressure curve function later in the video. Because we are talking about both pressure curves and pressure responses, let's take a little bit of time to make sure we understand the differences. First, a pressure response maps physical pressure to logical pressure. But a pressure curve maps logical pressure to logical pressure. Second, a pressure response is something we measure about a specific pen with a digital scale. It is a measurement of the physical world, and it describes a relationship that exists in the physical world. But a pressure curve is just a mathematical entity or a piece of code that we define to do anything we wish. The relationship it defines between the input logical pressure and the output logical pressure is completely arbitrary. Third, to clear up a misconception, many people think that the pressure curve does represent the pen's pressure behavior. That is not accurate. If you are looking at the pressure curve, you are not seeing the pressure behavior of the pen. You are seeing how the pressure behavior is being modified. The true pressure behavior of the pen is described by the pressure response. Fourth, to stress that point that the pressure curve and the pressure response are different, you should realize that when we draw the pressure curve on a chart, it can look quite different from when we draw the pressure response on a chart. In fact, you will be surprised how certain changes in the pressure curve show up in the shape of the pressure response that it creates. The most important pressure curve is the one that doesn't do anything. This is the null pressure curve. Whatever value it gets for the input logical pressure, it gives that value back as the output logical pressure. If we plot the null pressure curve, with the input logical pressure on the x-axis and the output logical pressure on the y-axis, then we get a straight line at 45 degrees connecting the lower left and the upper right corners of the chart. Whenever you see a pressure curve that looks like this, that means it is the null pressure curve and you can be sure it does not do anything. You can see on the right side that it does not affect the pressure response at all. The new pressure response is the orange line, and it is drawn right on top of the old pressure response, which is a purple line that you cannot see. The normal pressure curve is very useful though. For example, a tablet driver or a drawing application may implement a pressure curve, and they need to have a default value for those pressure curves. And many times they use a null pressure curve because it serves as an excellent default value because it does nothing. The null pressure curve is also very useful in debugging pressure problems. If you're trying to isolate some kind of pressure problem with your pen, maybe it's not behaving the way you think it should, one of the first things you should try is to make sure that your pressure curve is set to the null pressure curve. There is one noteworthy feature of the null pressure curve that I want to point out. The null pressure curve uses the full input logical pressure range and it uses the full output logical pressure range. It is not the only curve that does this, but some of the other pressure curves I'm going to show you soon don't have some of those features. For example, here is a curve that ignores the lower end of the input logical pressure range. That's indicated by the flat region on the lower left part of this pressure curve. All of the input logical pressure in that region is just being ignored. There is a corresponding flat region on the pressure response showing some physical pressure is being ignored 
but the width of that region is much less wide. The difference in the widths of these regions is a side effect of the shape of the original pressure response we started with. And this is one of the many cases where you will see that the pressure curve does not affect the pressure response in a way that you might expect. Another way of thinking about the effect that this curve has on the pressure response is that it has effectively increased the initial activation force. I would say the pressure response now effectively raises the initial activation force to about 80 gram force, which is incredibly high. So you are going to have to press down very hard with the pen to make even the smallest stroke. In terms of resource allocation, this pressure curve is deliberately ignoring, you could even say wasting, some of that pressure resource, the physical pressure range. At first glance, this can seem like a bad thing to do, but sometimes it can be very useful. For example, sometimes people drop their pen, and the next time they use it, they will notice that the pen is drawing even while it's hovering, when it's not touching the tablet. Now, I will be honest with you that most of the time this happens, the pen is damaged beyond repair. And most often, you will just have to get a replacement pen. However, sometimes you might be able to use a pressure curve to address the situation. You would do that by starting to move the lower left corner of the pressure curve more and more to the right and keep going until the pen starts drawing only when you're pressing down. I am not saying this is likely to work, but it is at least something you might want to explore if you run into the drawing on hover situation. And even if it does work, you will be left with a pen where you're going to have to really press down harder in order to draw. But at least that might be a temporary mitigation until you get a replacement pen. So again, in summary, I don't think it's likely to fix the problem, but it is worth a try. This curve ignores the upper part of the input logical pressure range. Look at the impact it has on the pressure response on the right. The flat region at the top has a very different width when you compare the pressure curve to the pressure response. Again, this is due to the original shape of the pressure response we started with. Notice that the new pressure response is ignoring a huge amount of the physical pressure range. In the end, it's leaving us with about 200 gram force of pressure range to work with after the curve is applied. This smaller pressure range means it will be harder to control the width of the stroke because the pen will just feel more sensitive to small changes in physical pressure. Ignoring the top end of physical pressure is useful in some cases. Consider the Wacom Pro Pen 2. It has a physical pressure range of about 800 gram force. 800 gram force is an almost scary amount of force to press down with on that pen. And some people I've talked to tell me that they have issues with their hands and they just cannot press down that hard. So they can't achieve maximum pressure, which means they can't achieve maximum brush size. Of course, you can address this problem just by making the brush size bigger. But as an alternative, you could use a pressure range that ignores a little bit of that top end of the input logical pressure range. But you have to be careful because as you can see, Ignoring just a little bit of the top end of input logical pressure goes a long way on the pressure response. So you will have to do this by trial and error and make sure you haven't removed too much of the physical pressure range. So far, all of the pressure curves I've showed you haven't looked like curves on that chart at all. They've all looked like lines or line segments, but this one clearly bends downwards. The effect this curve has on the pressure response is that it makes the response more linear. It's not perfectly linear, but it's close enough. So with this curve, we get a pressure response that gives us more predictable changes in the width of the stroke as the physical pressure changes. In the language of resource allocation, this specific curve combined with this specific pressure response gives us a new pressure response, which more evenly allocates the physical pressure range into the logical pressure range. This means we don't see any dramatic steep slopes or shallow slopes in the pressure response. This is clearly another example where the pressure curve does not look like the pressure response that it creates. I wanna stress one point about a linear pressure response in general. Please do not interpret my use of a linear pressure response to mean that a linear pressure response is always better. I just think a linear pressure response is a more convenient default pressure response for pens because it is more predictable in terms of how it will affect your drawing. 
Ultimately, it never matters what the pressure curve looks like or what the pressure response looks like. What matters is that the pressure works in a way that helps you draw. All I really want you to do is take the topics I'm raising in this video and explore how pressure curves work and find what works for you. So far, all the pressure curves I've shown you have used the full output logical pressure range. But now we're going to look at some curves that use only a portion of the output logical pressure range. This curve uses the full logical input pressure range, but it constrains the output logical pressure range. The visual effect of this curve on the pressure response is that the pressure response gets shifted up and gets shrunk vertically. The simple numerical interpretation of this curve is it takes the input logical pressure values that fall between 0 and 1, which is the full range, but it maps them or scales them into a range between 0.3 and 0.6 on the output logical pressure range. This may still be just a little too abstract and mathematical. Let's take a look at how the brush stroke would actually be affected. Imagine drawing a brush stroke that goes through the full range of physical pressure. And also imagine that we've set the brush size in our application to 100 pixels. On the top, you can see the kind of stroke that would be drawn if I was using the null pressure curve. The null pressure curve doesn't do anything, so the stroke I made goes through the full range of brush sizes from 1 pixel to 100 pixels. But on the bottom, what if I use the pressure curve that constrains the output range to between 0.3 and 0.6. The stroke that will be formed by this pressure curve will of course travel the same path, but the width is highly constrained also into the range of 30 pixels and 60 pixels. So if you are struggling with maintaining a consistent stroke width, but you do want to have some variation, you can consider one of these pressure curves that constrains the output of the logical pressure range. There is still a little bit of a problem here. This pressure curve still leaves the pressure response with a little bit of a remnant of that steeper slope at the beginning. So again, maybe we want a pressure response which is a little more linear and a little more predictable in how pressure will behave. We can fix this just by bending the pressure curve down while maintaining that constrained output logical pressure range. And now we get back to a more linear pressure response. Let's think about how some of this works under the covers. I showed you a number of pressure curves, and I showed you how those pressure curves affected the pressure response. I implemented my pressure curve as a single Python function in a Jupyter Notebook. This let me easily show the pressure curve as a chart and the pressure response as a chart. The smallest pressure curve function you could have only needs to take in one parameter, which is the input logical pressure. But my pressure curve function has five additional parameters to control the shape of the pressure curve. So six parameters in all. This is what the body of the pressure curve function actually looks like. And you can see all six parameters are used. Instead of walking through the code, I'm just gonna show you a demo of me interactively playing around with the parameters. And you will see exactly how the pressure curve affects the pressure response in real time. And now you can see I'm just moving the sliders around and you can get very different shapes for the pressure curve. And you can see there are very different effects on the pressure response. Earlier in the video, I showed you a little bit of code that takes the logical pressure and computes brush size. But you only saw one line of code. And I think it's helpful to show you more of the code that's around it. It's really very simple. We take the normalized logical pressure, which has a range of 0 to 1. And then we apply the pressure curve function to it, of course, with any additional parameters we need. And then we get a new pressure, which here is called the adjusted pressure. And it still is a value that goes from 0 to 1. And then we multiply the adjusted pressure by the user's preferred brush size. And that gives us the final brush size we'll be drawing with. In this episode, we really just covered the basics of pressure curves and pressure response. And there's more coming in episode 4. Thanks for your time. And I hope you enjoyed this video.